Okay, Boker Tov, good morning, everyone. I want to thank our sponsors for the year, Dr. Zavi and Bella Morgan, who have sponsored Zechah Nishmas, Dr. Brian Galbit, who lives a life filled with Torah, Voda, Hashem, and Amuna. Also want to wish this morning a very happy birthday to Esti Lupin. Many more in good health and happiness. I was invited to take a cup of coffee. It occurred to me it may be a very bad sign that before every class, the one before this, this one, I invite everyone to have a cup of coffee at the beginning of the class. I don't know what that says about the class or your reaction to it, that we have to give out coffee or Red Bull in order for you to get through it, but, but so be it. We're up to you. Sod Hamayim, page Pei Aleph, Tzadik Be'amunaso Yechia, Tzvi. Tzadik Be'amunaso Yechia, Revolbiz prescription and formula to how to be alive. Not just how to live a life of meaning and purpose, but how to actually be alive. If you're not connected to a higher power, if you're focused only on yourself, if you think you control the universe, if you're filled with envy and jealousy and anger, then you are dead even while you are alive. And there are people walking around like that. We all know them. They're hollow inside. They're, they're, they're suffering. They're in pain. They're dead even while they're alive. And there are people who have nothing or who are suffering in, in reality, but if they're connected to something bigger and they're devoted and dedicated to a bigger picture, if they, for, if they concede and they let go and let God, then you're able to be alive even if you're the walking dead. So tzadik be'amun asa yechi. Yisod ha'mayim. Again, the background. Rechaim Vital told us there are four elements within a person. We have four physical elements within us. They are fire, water, wind, and earth. Each of these elements inside ourselves expresses itself in different um, qualities, in different behaviors, in different temperaments, and so on. So when we see that there is a quality which is uh, dysfunctional or not working or corrupt, then it's not because the quality as the symptom needs to be fixed, it's because the core, the element on the inside, there's something wrong, there's something dysfunctional, there's something that needs to be improved. So we spoke about Aish, which comes out as arrogance and anger. We spoke about Ruach, that comes out in language, how we use our language to build, to construct, to uplift, or to destroy. And it brings us up to Yesod HaMayim. HaYesod HaShlishi Yesod HaMayim, Mimenu Nevas Midos HaKena V'Ataiva. So that water, the quality of water inside us, expresses itself that there's an imbalance in the H2O within us. It expresses itself in jealousy and in lust. Niten Lahavim V'Pashtos Ketzim Avatan Kena Yidei Amuna. How do you, and, and again, why are we speaking about all this? This is not a class on character growth, although really it is, but in theory it's not. It's about emuna. So why are we talking about these things? Because Rav Volba's, and really Rav Chaim Vital at his core was trying to tell us, don't address the quality. Somebody's getting angry a lot, so don't try to conquer the anger, as the Kutzker said. If you try to break anger, you're just going to have many pieces of anger. You're not going to get rid of the anger. You've got to heal the fire in your belly. If you are struggling with envy and jealousy and lust and desire, then don't try to conquer those qualities. Understand this notion of water, what's at its core. And the way to address all four of these imbalances, says Revolba, is... Drum roll, please. Amuna. Amuna. Thank you very much. The more that we are connected with, tied to, deferring to, in awe and reverence of Hashem, the less that we will struggle with these manifestations. Kvishikos of Ramchal, as the Ramchal wrote in Mesila Sisharim, Omnam. The Gemar Numa says, If a person really knew that nobody can touch what's designated for you, what's designated for you, what you're meant to have, no one and nothing can touch. So if we understood that, We'd never be jealous or envious of what anyone else has. Well, where does envy and jealousy come from? By the way, this is very, very important to understand. These are two separate qualities, envy and jealousy, and they're not equal and they're not both bad. One can look at what someone else has and say, you know, that looks pretty good. I'm happy for them. They deserve it. I'm happy they have it. They should enjoy it. But I'm now driven and motivated to have it too. So they have shalom bias, or they have nachas from their children, or they have nice things, or they're tapped into learning and davening and beautiful growth. And you say, you know, that's really beautiful. I'm really happy for them. I want them to have it. I want them to enjoy it. But you know what? I'm driven to get it too. That's not the type of envy that the Torah is rejecting. What the Torah says is when you look at someone else and you say, why do they have that and I don't? 
I deserve it, not them. That low life, icevarf, miserable, negative, <laughs> difficult, complaining, reject, that person has the shell and bias, and I'm fighting all the time? That lazy, good for nothing, self centered, narcissistic bum has amazing children to give him nachas, and I'm struggling with my children? That incompetent, pathetic moron has all the success and beautiful things and I'm driving this old car and living in this rickety house? That's what the Torah says. That's the envy and jealousy that the Torah says when you look at what someone else has and you think you deserve it. Why are they entitled to it? You're not happy for them and you don't wish them well. We spoke about in Simchas Torah at the women's shear, the ability to fargin someone. That one of the ways of Nosei Ba'olam Chavero is not just to feel someone other's pain. That's easy to feel someone other's pain. It's not easy at all. But relative, it's easy. Why? Because you look at someone who's suffering or in pain, you hear somebody, Chas V'Shalom, was diagnosed with an illness or going through a financial crisis or going through a personal crisis, and you say, wow, I feel so bad for them. I feel their pain. I want to help. Why is that easier? Because you say, wow, thank God that's not me. I'll help them because maybe that'll help but not be contagious to me. Thank God that's not me. But then you see someone else won the lottery. And the one the lottery could be their child got engaged, they have a grandchild, financially they've achieved a certain level of success. And, and that's harder because then you look at them and say, not, why not me? You look at them and say, I'm sorry, not, not looking to say, why, thank God, not me. You look at them and say, why not me? Why not me? So the ability to fargin, to be happy for someone else is really a more difficult lover, level and in that way a higher level. So not all envy or jealousy is equal or the same or is prohibited or is rejected by the Torah. What the, what the Torah tells us is, don't look at what someone else has and say, I deserve it, not them. And why shouldn't you ever do that? Because when you do that, not only are you being unfair to that person who you really should be happy and, and revel in their success, but you're being unfair and you're compromising your relationship with Hashem Himself, with the Almighty. Why? Because what you're saying to Hashem mm -hmm. is, I don't trust that you're going to provide what I need. I don't trust that you're really in charge. I'm worried somebody else can take what I have. <coughs> so how do we strengthen ourselves in this amuna? I've shared before, when we learned several years ago, the Chazanish is Amuna Ubitachon. The Chazanish has a magnificent book called Amuna Ubitachon. That's only one chapter in the book, and the book addresses broader issues, but we studied that chapter together, Amuna Ubitachon, how to live with faith. And there the Chazanish defined for us what is faith. Emunah and Bitachon, the Chazanish said, is not what most people think. Most people mistakenly think, you know what Bitachon is? I want such and such result, and I trust that Hashem is going to bring it about. That's not Bitachon. You're not really having faith in Hashem, you're really worshiping yourself, and you're using God as a means to achieve what you yourself want. No. Bitachon is not, I want such and such, and I trust Hashem will bring it. Bitachon is, in my finite view of the world, I would love a... But you know what? Whatever Hashem gives, whether it's A or B, I trust that it's for the best. Wherever it comes from and whatever it is, I trust it's from Him. Last week, the family just got up from Shiva for Rabbi Joey Azar, who was an extraordinary tzaddik. He died way tragically young, 47 years old. His parents live here in Boca, and he spent the last months of his life getting treatment here in Boca and part of an experimental uh, treatment, which unfortunately, obviously, obviously failed. I know we were in Griscolo many years ago with Joey. You haven't known him actually in Camp Ask. And it had been a long hiatus of interacting with him. But these last several months living here, we went to visit and we spent time with him. He, he was just all these people that Hashem has, has taken from us inexplicably and incomprehensibly over this last period of time, all young people under 50. Every one of them was just the amazing, most amazing role models in this Emunah and Bitachon, which makes it even harder to understand. But on the other hand, we latch on and grab onto their amuna. So, did I tell this story last week? When I went on Yom Kippur? I don't remember. I went on Yom Kippur, we had a break in davening. And I went on Yom Kippur, it was in, it was in Israel, and I went with my son, my young son, to, uh, to go visit Joey. It was a break of Yom Kippur. What more appropriate way could you use your time than visiting somebody in that situation? So I went and I... I thought I'd give a bracha to him that, you know, the experimental treatment is, is going to work. Just stay well enough and strong enough to be able to continue to, to be part of it. And you'll see, Joey, things are going to turn around. And Mir Tashem is one of his ten children had just gotten engaged the week before. And uh, I said, you're going to dance at his wedding. It's going to be amazing. And I finished giving him this whole bracha. And he looked 
in my eyes, and he said, Rebefram, you must not have heard, but right before Yom Kippur, we decided that tomorrow I'm starting, I'm going on hospice. The doctors have given up hope, and the treatments aren't working, and there's nothing more that can be done, and tomorrow I'm starting hospice. So he must have seen the look in my face, and he said to me the following words, which I am repeating verbatim, and I cannot make this up. He said, why are you sad? This is Hashem's plan, and I am 100% on board. Those were his words. This is Hashem's plan, and I am 100% on board, because everything he does is for the best, and this is what's meant to be. So he said to me, I've enjoyed my time in this world, and now I'm preparing for the world to come. And they say the world to come is a pretty good place. And that was it, with a smile, and then talking about How's your family? What's happening in your life? And what's going on? And he didn't do that because I was going to tell this story at the Amunashir. He didn't do that because some art book was going to be written about him. In his core, in his core, and I can testify with absolute sincerity and authenticity, that's what he believed. That's what he believed. And so did Brian, and so did Danny, and so did Mike Stern, and so did all these people. So how could we ever doubt or compromise our Amuna. How could we sit here and say, where's God and there is no God, when the very people who are the ones who are no longer here and who went through, and he went through unbearable pain and suffering at the end, Rib Joey, and they didn't compromise in their Amuna and Iota. In fact, and the next day I was back and he said to me, <coughs> it's unimaginable words. He said, this is going to be my last Simchas Torah. Can you please come by and dance with me? <laughs> and by the time Simchas Torah came, I went, Shimi who knew him, and he was already in bed and could barely open his eyes, but he held our hand, and the next day we danced with him in bed. These are, these are people that are just, they're, they're another level, they're next level in that emuna. There's just no doubt in their mind that Hashem is in charge, and He runs the world, and there's nothing to talk about, and this is all there is. This is all there is. And Yechavit can also tell you, and I don't want to take too much time, every conversation with him was this Amunah, was this faith in Hashem and his plan and why he does things and trusting in him and that he's in charge. So that's Tzadik Ba'amunah So Yechia. Tzadik Ba'amunah So Yechia. We live through, we live through confronting unimaginable circumstances and situations by realizing that he's in charge and that we have to be on board, that he's the one with the plan. Yeah, also his name is Yo- his name is Yosef Tzvi, Tzvi, Tzadik Be'emunaso Yechia. Baruch Tzvi, Brian was Baruch Tzvi, Tzadik Be'emunaso Yechia. Yeah. Ain't no new bando, what you would say. Ain't no new There is nothing and nobody but him. Ain't no new bando. Ain't no new bando, ain't no new bando. So there are those people, they live with Ain't no new bando. You know, we have a revolba actually, not in this Sefer, but in a Sefer on Chumash. I didn't get to it in the Parsha Shir yesterday, surprisingly. But yesterday, um, Hashem identifies himself and, and he, he's, he talks about, the, the Pasuk just describes that Avram's going to be a bracha, he's going to be God's, uh, Avram's God, and Rashi there quotes, Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Yaakov. And Revolba writes on this, why do we say in our davening, Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, and Elokei Yaakov? And the answer is because, you know, we, I can't talk about you, the righteous group in this room, I, very simple person, struggle with where is Hashem, when is Hashem, why is Hashem, how is Hashem. We struggle. And when we struggle, and when we have difficulty seeing Him and finding Him and latching on to Him and trusting in Him, we turn to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. And we latch on to Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, and Elokei Yaakov. But sometimes to see somebody who we admire, somebody who's great in, in intellect and great in character, somebody who's great, and they see Hashem, we can latch on and we can hold on to them. So sometimes, like, where is God? I'm, I can't, I'm going to discover Him on my own. I'm going to see Him and feel Him on my own. It's hard. So we see Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and we daven, the beginning of our davening. We open our Shemona Esrei with Elokeinu v'elokei avoseinu. He's my God. I'm looking for Him. I have to have my own personal relationship with Him. I have my own stories. And I have my own stories. I could tell you amazing stories. Just tap into the Goldberg WhatsApp group of Vashkacha Pratis and our family, and you can have that, you should have that WhatsApp group of your family, and all you have to do when you're feeling down and out and wondering where he is, is go back to the WhatsApp group and read it or listen to what's recorded on there and say, wow, in just last week, look at how much he did in my, for my family. So he's Elokeinu. We have to develop our own personal, very real relationship with him. But even when we struggle, we can fall back on and rely, Elokei Avoseinu. 
Elokei Avram, Elokei Yitzchak, and Elokei Yaakov. So that's, when you struggle with that Amuna, you look at Brian Galbert, and you look at Joey Azo, and you look at Danny Grejo, and you look at Mike Stern, and you look at, I'm just mentioning the young people, but you don't have to be young. You look at extraordinary people all around us, and for some of us, members of our own family, alive who are no longer here, who find that ability, find a Holocaust survivor, who still has faith in Hashem, and say, that, you know what, whatever doubts I have, forget about it. Forget about it. I think also it says El Kavaseinu that we're tapping into our own parents, grandparents, grandparents. It's in our DNA. We just look back on some of the family members. I'm so happy you're here. That is such I'm a great shot. Not, I mean, obviously, the Avos are our DNA also. But yeah. even closer, just tapping That's an amazing, beautiful shot. That's great. So when, it's, it's in yeah, us. Yeah, it's our no problem. It's our no problem. Our Everything I say, I'm just repeating what she told me. So, <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> So she said, Yechevet said the following. She said, when we say, Elokei Avoseinu, what we're really saying the God of my forefathers is, maybe right now I feel today that I'm struggling to see or feel Hashem. But I need to know that Elokei Avoseinu, it's in my DNA. My parents, my grandparents, my great-grandparents, they ran from a pogrom or they suffered an expulsion or they were in persecution or they survived the Holocaust or even if they didn't go through any of those hard things at all, they just lived life and they did it with a faith in Hashem and therefore I need to know that it's in me. When I feel like I don't have the ability, I need to know that it's in my DNA. So the Kei Avoseinu is not just that I'm latching on to their God somewhere else because somehow I'm just supposed to connect through them, but I'm connecting through me, through the them that's in me, through the Elokei Avoseinu that's in my DNA and that's in me. Someone, I was once talking to somebody, I may have shared this before also, I was once talking to somebody who's in the 12-step recovery program who told me, you know, one of the steps is submitting to a higher power which I think is fascinating, that the ability to really live our best lives and to conquer our addictions and our urges <coughs> includes, you have a whole mass movement of success of people who stick with the program, which includes, it's an Amuna class. Every 12-step meeting is basically an Amuna shir, and basically <coughs> collectively submitting to a higher power and talking about that. So what happens when someone's new to the program, or even if they're not new, and they're struggling to submit to a higher power? They have doubt and uncertainty, and they don't see a higher power. So apparently, he told me, one of the, the people who I admire so much who's part of this, uh, part of the recovery community, told me that there's an idea of finding somebody and submitting to their higher power. That even if you're struggling, you find somebody who's feeling connected and you latch onto them. You are submitting to their higher power. So every Shemona Esrei, we begin with Elokeinu. We're submitting to our higher power. High, higher, high, higher power. I'm turning to you, I'm praising you, I'm remembering who you are vis-a-vis me. And now, higher power, I need you for atachonin adam das. I need you to be thoughtful and mindful and for intellect and to have creativity and good judgment and ideas. Higher power, I need you to bring me close to you. Higher power, I'm looking for forgiveness from you. Higher power, I need good health and, and rifa'inu for the people who are sick around me. And barich aleinu, please help the stock market go up. And, I, and I, <laughs> higher power, I'm looking for justice and I'm looking for redemption and everything higher power. So what happens if I don't get past elokeinu? I'm having trouble connecting with a higher power. Then I go to elokei avoseinu. I go to the people and I connect through their higher power. I was just in Israel for the long weekend for a family simcha and I always try to connect with great people because it's contagious. Their greatness overflows and becomes contagious and you become energized. So I landed and I happened to have traveled with Rabbi Gibber who was going anyway and he had an appointment and went together with him to see Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And you know, Rav Chaim Kanievsky, you don't exactly have long elaborate conversations with Rav Chaim Kanievsky. You get... He, the, the line through his apartment, down the steps, and up the block is so long that it would take him too long to even say bracha v'hatzlacha to people that he now says buha, bracha v'hatzlacha. I'm not, I am not joking. If you're lucky and you're connected like Rabbi Gibber is, and I'm grateful to him for this, then there was no one else there, there was no line, it was really off hours, and then you get to spend a few moments and you can have like a one-sentence conversation. Which, it's, so why do we go? So he put it brilliantly, Rabbi Gibber. He said, you know, Rav Chaim, is on fire. He, he's, he's the energy that's running through him. If he just shakes your hand and says, bracha v'atzlacha, the energy passes through his hand to yours. You've like, you've plugged in. You've plugged in, you've recharged your battery instantly just by making that contact. He's Kula Torah. He makes a siyam on Kula Torah Kula every year. He's living literally in another world, in another planet, disconnected from the trappings of this universe, consumed only with Torah from morning till night and everything in between. 
and whatever hashkafik, not hashkafikly, but there's greatness. There's absolute greatness and purity there. And he's on fire. There's, there's electricity running through his veins. And when he holds your hand and says, Bracha Vatzlacha, you've just plugged in, even if it's for a moment, you've recharged your batteries. And I went to Rav Asher Weisashir, my Rebbe, and met with him afterwards. And I went for the first time on Motei Shabbos to uh, Rav Tzvi Meyer, uh, unbelievable tzaddik in Yerushalayim, who, did I speak about this yesterday in the parasha Shir? Yeah. I've got yeah. major senior moments going on. So, just to tell you, I'm a, I'm a member of the senior community now. It's okay. I'm not insulting anybody. So, I spoke about it yesterday. I went an hour and a half after Shabbos and Hishal Shittas was still going. And when I left three hours after Shabbos, Hishal Shittas was still going. It was pitch black in the room. Everyone was singing. He was speaking. And it was like, again, being transported to another planet, another universe, another world. And you walk away from those interactions and you say, Elokei Avoseinu. You walk around from those interactions and you say, I've made contact with greatness. Maybe I have doubt, maybe I have uncertainty, maybe I don't see him. But you know what, if I surround myself and I tap into and I latch onto those who do, then, then I'm able to, to see and to achieve amazing, amazing greatness. Yafa Eliyach has in her book, Tales of Hasidim, the story of the, uh, which Rebbe is in that book all about? The great Rebbe in the Holocaust. Who did she talk about? Where they had to jump over this, ca- this major, everyone know the story? They had to jump over this maser, and, and who did you grab onto? I'll tell you the story next week so I don't butcher it. Anyway, back to our text. So, back to our text. So, why do we get into all of this? Because what Avob is telling us, based on that Gemara, if we understand that there's a God, and we understand that He runs the universe, and we understand He's in charge, that He has a plan, and we're 100% on board, then we don't look at what everyone else has and feel jealous or envious or say, why them? I deserve it. Oh, so back to the Chazanish. The Chazanish said, Bitochan and Emuna, Bitochan and Emuna, it's like, it's like ways. We have to constantly reroute to get, back, to get back to the destination. We are off track all day long, constantly rerouting. So the Chazanish says, Emuna Bitochan is not that I have confidence God will do what I want. It's that whatever God does, I have confidence it's for the best, that he has a plan and I'm 100% on board. And in there he tells the story. He says, if you really have Emuna and Bitochan, if you really trust in Hashem, then you're not going to ever be competitive in business. You won't ever see someone as your competitor. Why? And he gives the story. He says, you know, imagine you have a store on a block and you pretty much have the tapped into the, the business in the neighborhood and somebody opens a competing store across the street. So he says, if you're an ordinary person, you're going to feel jealousy and envious. You're going to be threatened. You're going to be worried. You're going to lower your prices and try to drive them out. You're going to tell your distributors, you can only sell to me, not to him. Otherwise, I'm not selling your wares. If you're threatened, then you're going to try to undermine. But if you really have bitachan and amun and you say, you know, whatever I'm supposed to make, I'm going to make this year. And nobody can touch that. And nobody can compromise that. And nobody can tap into that. So then what you're really going to do is go across the street and say, welcome to the neighborhood. How can I help you? Do you need a number of a distributor? Do you want somebody who does marketing? How can I help you set up shop? Chazanish writes this. And he says, Emunah bitachon are not in the shul how hard you shuckle or how long your Shemona Esri are. Emunah bitachon are when you go out to the workplace. What is your attitude and what is your mentality? How generous of spirit are you or are you threatened and worried? So we learned that together many years ago. By many, I mean a few. When we learned the Chazanish in, in this year. And then there was a story that came out last year in Brooklyn of a person whose fish market burnt to the ground. There was a fire. And two blocks away, he had a, there was a competitor who had a fish store. And he <coughs> invited the person whose market had burned down and said, I have room in my store. Why don't you open shop in the corner? And we'll both operate out of the same store until your store is rebuilt. He was actually given an award by New York, by a city councilman in New York. He was given an acknowledgement, a word of recognition for that. I wrote an article about this because it really was amazing to me. We had learned that Chazanish, and then we said, yeah, but who's like that? Who could live up to that? That's a nice ideal. Who could ever do that? And here you had a Yid, a Jew in Brooklyn, who said to his competitor two blocks away, whatever I meant to make, I'm going to make. You could operate literally inside my store, and it won't hurt my business in Iota. Hashem is so great, He can produce enough for both of us to make a living. And if you think Hashem can't enable both of us to make a living, then you don't have faith in Hashem. You've diminished Hashem. You don't trust in Hashem. So trust in Hashem is realizing that there's enough for everybody. So the moment I feel envious or jealous of what you have, why do you have the new Tesla? Why did you move into the new house? Why do you have a beautiful new son-in-law, daughter-in-law, or grandchild? Why do you have such happiness and shalom bias and did you come back from such an amazing vacation? You don't deserve those things. I do. 
then I don't believe Hashem could give it to both of us. And I don't believe that I have what I need and what I deserve. So how do we strengthen our amuna in this area? Says Revolbe, I'll give you a skula. I'm making fun because it's not a skula. You can't tie a red bendel around your wrist and all of a sudden you'll have shalom bias and nachas and it don't work that way. It don't work that way. What's the skula? We're an am segula. The Pasuk tells us we're an am segula. And why are we an am segula? Because we have tefillah and mitzvos. So it says Revob, it's very simple. Every morning you wake up and the first thing we do is we say Mauda'ani. And after that we say Birchas HaShachar, the morning blessings. And the morning blessings, 15 blessings, calibrate our morning. First thing we do, before you have that cup of coffee, even before you go to shul, Birchas HaShachar were designed not to be said at shul. They're said as part of the routine of how you wake up in the morning. If you're going to learn for an hour before davening, you don't wait to say Birchas HaShachar. You say it first when you wake up. If you're going to go for a walk around the circle, you say Birchas HaShachar, even if you're only going to first daven when you get home because it wasn't even light out when you went for the walk. But the way we wake up in the morning, the routine, the morning routine of a Jew is you brush your teeth, you wash Negevasa, you brush your teeth, you get dressed, you say Birchas HaShachar. And why is that part of the morning routine? Because these 15 brachos calibrate our day. They set us on the path of an attitude of gratitude, of the recognition of all the blessing and all the good, of what are priorities and what is important, of what matters and what just doesn't matter. These 15 brachas, these 15 blessings, our rabbis with their great wisdom, their divine inspired wisdom, understood and authored these brachos to help us begin. So what happens, most people mumble them while they're still packing the lunches for the kids, or mumble them while they're running late to shul, or mumble them while they're still getting dressed, or mumble them, Open a sitter, say them slowly and carefully, and tap into the genius of every one of them. Not because God needs to hear you say that bracha, but because it will change your day. If you want to understand them better, there's a fantastic series called Sitter Snippets. <laughs> that you can listen to. I'll offer this shameless plug, because not only can you now sign up to get them delivered right to your phone on WhatsApp every day. We're finishing Ashrei. Yesterday we did Paseach HaSiyadecha Maspi Lechochai Ratzon, also very much along the lines of this theme. But as of today, you can not only listen by signing up for the WhatsApp group, but if you listen to podcasts on Apple Podcasts or any podcast player, you can now listen to Sitter Snippets on Podcast Player. And you know what the benefit is? If you listen on WhatsApp, you have to listen in real time. But if you have a podcast player and you subscribe and listen, you could listen at one and a half speed or two speed and then the three minute sitter snippets. <laughs> they don't have to be six minute sitter snippets. You could listen twice as fast and listen in half the time. So anyway, if you go back to the beginning of the, po- of the sitter snippets, we started with Moda'ani, but we went through all the Birchas HaShachar. So why am I telling you all this shameless plug? Because the, the uh, Revolba here says, there's one bracha in particular where every single day we can remind ourselves about this. And that is the bracha of Sha'asali kol tzarchi. Hashem, you prepare for me, you give me whatever I need. I think I want more. And there's nothing wrong with wanting more. That's where we get ambition and aspiration and drive, is because we want more. There are people who are underachievers in life. Sadly, they're not driven. They need a little healthy dose of drive. Drive is a good thing. Drive is a good thing. But on the one hand, there's my attitude, which is I'm driven for more. And on the other hand, there's after the fact that whatever I got, I have the ability to be happy with what I have. I'm happy with my lot. I'm happy with my spouse. I'm happy with my children. I'm happy with my children-in-law. I'm happy with my finances. I'm happy with my house. I'm happy with my car. I may continue to be driven to have more, and I should be. Drive is wonderful. We are overachievers. We are born to work hard. Adam la amal yulad. But after I've put in all my effort, after I've taken my initiative, after I've done my work, when I reflect, I have to say when I close my eyes at night, Sha'asali kotsarki. We say that bracha in the morning, but I'm saying we have to think at night. Sha'asali kotsarki. Hashem, you've given me and you've prepared for me everything I need. So here's an invitation. Every morning when you say this bracha, pause and think about that chazanish and think about this revolba and think about Rabbi Joey Azar and say, Hashem, this is your plan and I am 100% on board. Whatever I'm confronting and whatever I have or whatever I don't have, that's your plan and I am 100% on board. So as I wake up and I start my day and I say, Shasali Goltzarki, I'm gonna be driven today. I'm gonna take initiative today. I'm gonna work hard today, but I'm never gonna be envious or jealous of what someone else has. I'm never gonna say that I deserve it more. I'm never going to deny that what you give me is what I need. Hein begashmias, whether it's in the physical realm, 
Hain Baruchnius or in the spiritual universe. But Perka Bitachon Omer David Amelach in the in the chapter of Tehillim, that is the the chapter of Bitachon, which is chapter twenty three. Everybody knows Psalm twenty three. David Amelach says, Hashem Roi Lo Echsar, God, you are my shepherd. The word Roi can be read two ways. A Roa is a is a shepherd, but a Rea is a is a friend. Why are shepherd and friend the same word? Why are shepherd and friend the word, same word? Because the shepherd is a friend to his or her flock. The relationship of a shepherd to the flock is not just, I have a job, I got to put a check, I have a responsibility. The shepherd, the description of Moshe Rabbeinu putting his little sheep on his shoulder and carrying the tired sheep who fell behind, who was drinking from the brook. A person has a sheep. Hashem ro'i lo achzar. Hashem ro'i is re'a. A shepherd is a friend. A shepherd is a friend. I'll tell you an amazing story. Moshe Weinberg loves to tell the story he once read in a Reader's Digest. And it's very apropos, Mr. Sanders, because if you ever got to hear him daven, it could be him in the story. You know the story of the uh, poetry contest? It was a poetry contest which was advertised, and all the competitor, competitors submitted their application, and it's the day of the big competition, and everybody's reading. And as the competition is winding up, and each one's selected from a different poet, a different author, a different great work, and read dramatically their poem before the judges, a last moment, an elderly man walks in and he comes to the judge's table and he says, I want to, I want to participate. I want to compete. He said, well, it's kind of late. Everybody else did early. But they looked at this man and he was so sincere and he wanted so badly to compete. They said, fine, one last entry. So he got up before the judges and he opened Tehillim Chav Gimel, Psalm 23. Mizmo David Hashem Ro'i Lo Achzar, a psalm to David. The Lord is my shepherd. I'm not lacking anything. And he read this short capital from his heart. And of course, the judges then met, and they came back with the result, and he had won the competition. So one of the earlier competitors, one of the younger competitors said, came to this older man and said, I don't understand. I read the same passage. I read the same psalm. That was what I selected too. I had a coach, and I practiced, and I rehearsed, and I worked it for months, and you came in on a whim in the last moment, and you submitted to compete, and you won? I don't understand. How did you do it? And the older man looked at him, and he said, you read about the shepherd. I know the shepherd. I have a relationship with the shepherd. Hashem ro'i lo achzar. Do we have a relationship with that shepherd? So that's what David HaMelech says in the capital that is about bitachon. Hashem ro'i. If we know the shepherd, we know he's his friend, our friend. We know he loves us, and we know that we're 100% on board with his plan. Lo achzar. I lack nothing. Amei menuchos yinahaleini. So, besides tranquil waters, he leads me. My soul stirs for him. How? God put me, in, there's no corners. Not in a rectangular, not in a rectangle, but in a circle. Hashem gives out to each person exactly what we need, what we deserve, what's right for us. Whatever I got is devoted for His name. If we understand that we're all workers for Him, we're in this world because we have a job to do, a mission to fulfill for Him. So each worker, each unit of the army is given what they need. So the tankist doesn't say to the combat soldier, he doesn't say to the paratrooper, the, the, the combat soldier doesn't say, it's not fair, where's my parachute? God says, you're not in the tzanchanim, you're a combat soldier. The combat soldier doesn't say, well, it's not, where's my tank? He says, you're not in the tank division. The tankist doesn't say, where's my computer? You're not in, in the uh, in, in intelligence. Every unit gets what they need to be able to serve that greater goal. So that's what David Amalekir was saying, Laman Shemo. If I'm in an army that's here and devoted to change the world in God's image, if I'm in a unit of an army that's here to make a difference in Hashem's world, then I don't say, why don't I have what He has? Why don't they have what I have? I say, I have what I need to serve in my unit, to fulfill what I need to do. If a person gets to that point of tzedek, you see that all that God does is righteous, then they don't doubt what they have. I get this uh, newsletter, this little email every morning with some unusual fact. And I read through them, and uh, once every two weeks is one that's worth saving to use in a drasha. 
So I'll tell you this morning's, and I was trying to figure out how I was going to save this for a drush, if it was worth it. I didn't figure it out, but I'll tell it to you now because maybe that's why I got it. <laughs> you ever use a tape measure? Anyone ever use a tape measure? Mm-hmm. On the end of the tape measure, there's a little hook. That hook has a name. It's called, I think, a tangle. I forgot what it said in the article. There's a name to that hook. You ever notice about that hook something which is, can be annoying about it and you think is broken? And every time you buy one or you use one, you say, why is mine not right? The little hook is loose. You ever notice that? Yes. So you might try to tighten what's holding it in place. You might try to glue it and you might try to fix it because you say, mine is deficient, mine is broken, mine is lacking, mine didn't come right. So the article says, this morning's little article telling us uh, these uh, unusual facts says, it's by design. You know why it comes that way? Because when you hook it around something in order to measure the hook, you're not going to have an accurate measurement because the hook has also a length or a depth and therefore you don't have an actual accurate measurement. So to offset the depth of the, of the hook, of the tangle, is the fact that it wiggles, it's looseness, because that's what makes your measurement accurate. So if you fix it, you're actually breaking it. And the fact that it's loose and wiggles is what allows it to work properly. So here's my interpretation of that for us to close this morning, is that sometimes we have things in life that look like they're broken. And we wonder, why did I get a broken one? Why is it loose? Why is it wiggling? Why is it broken? And we're trying to fix something that really was designed right to begin with, that really was designed in our interest, was really designed for us to work. And when we fix it, we actually break it. And if we use what we think is broken, we'd realize that it's perfect and it's fixed to begin with, and we'd be 100% on board. Whatever Hashem gives us, our tape measure that looks like it has loose parts in life, that looks like it's broken, sometimes don't try to fix it. Because it's brokenness is what makes it work and makes it work accurately. Embrace it and realize that tzedek, l'ma'an shemo, that if we're here to serve him, we have what we need. So this is this element of water inside ourselves, is never to be jealous and never to be envious and never to pursue lust, is to realize we have what we need and what we have is from Hashem, and therefore we have the ability to be happy with it. If you always think that what my neighbor has would make me happy, you know what happens? What happens when you get what your neighbor had? You and you're still not happy. You want what another neighbor has and what the other neighbor had. Yesh lomana rotsa masayim. If you have 100, you always want 200. But if you realize I have what I need, then you have the ability to always be happy with whatever you have. All right, the Mirza Shem will pick up with this next week.